What is going on, Diesel Nation? We're really excited to have you guys on today's podcast. Today, I don't know if I've ever learned as much on an episode as I'm going to learn today. I'm going to be chatting with Robert from First Gen Industries about some things that not many people know about Cummins, Dodge, how that marriage came to be with a Cummins engine in a Dodge truck, how it almost didn't happen, and a lot of really cool information that goes in the background story. And then also, for the first gen guys out there for really hard to find parts to be able to either fix or restore your truck he's got some really cool info for us so we look forward to chatting with him before we get to it we want to remind you guys you can save 20 percent at kershaw.kiausa.com kershaw knives is a sponsor of the podcast we really appreciate them offering this discount code for our listeners so you guys can save 20 percent off on something that is for everyday carry hunting fishing at work, around the house. They've got a ton of choices for different budgets. So no matter what kind of uh, budget or use that you have for a knife, they've got something for you. So definitely make sure you take advantage of that. Also, if you're listening on YouTube, you appreciate the content, you're learning a lot. If you subscribe, make sure you turn on the notification button, like and comment. It helps us reach new diesel owners, people who are looking for information, maybe they're stuck on a problem. And one of our guests has answered that question or has some tips, goes a long way to be able to help us. All right, let's get to today's episode with Robert and learning about some information you probably don't know about Cummins and Dodge. Robert, welcome to the Diesel Podcast. I'm excited to chat about first-gen Cummins with you today, and it's a platform that I know of, but I'm not incredibly knowledge about, and I know it's your passion, it's your business, so I know we're going to have a great conversation and appreciate your time today. Well, I appreciate you having me. This is an absolute pleasure. I followed your Instagram page for a while for the truck pictures and also the old advertisements, like from the late 80s, early 90s. That, and I'm like, man, things were so simple then. And you could just go down to your local Dodge dealer and get a, you know, a first gen a first gen Cummins, and it was so easy and a lot cheaper than they are now. <laughs> yes. Ironically, we have gone both ways. I When I started in this, these trucks were very expensive, and then they got real dirt cheap, and now they've kind of reversed again, where now they're worth more than they were new. Oh, yeah. I have see some for sale with low mileage in their high 30s, low 40s, sometimes even more, depending how low a mileage that they have. Yeah, and these trucks, when they were new, were ranged between twenty and 25000 for your most common diesel configurations. Wow. Wow. Well, I, I know there's a lot of interest in them and um, you know, a lot of questions we get, but I wanted to start with your background, getting passionate about these trucks, and then also your business, because you specialize in servicing you know, these trucks and people who own them. Yeah, so it this this definitely turned in. I, I say there's different levels. You know, you have an interest in something in life. You have you know a passion for it, and then you you're far gone. And then there's a few of us that are way above that, <laughs> where I want to call it retarded or past sanity. I don't know what you call it, but it didn't start out for me that way. I mean, quite I'll be very open with you. The my getting into this was actually an accident. Uh, my very first vehicle ended up being a truck that I call the 90. It's my silver regular cab uh, that I've got two stacks on. That was the very first vehicle I ever owned. And when I was 17 years old, my dad said to me, okay, enough of driving my vehicle. It's time for you to to buy a vehicle of your own. Do you know what you want? And I grew up on a farm. So it's like, yeah, I need a pickup truck. He said, excellent answer. Is there something specifically you're thinking about? And I grew up around his drag racing Mopars and all. So I was thinking something like a Dakota RT, you know, maybe an SST or Indy edition Ram. And he's like, no, 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 that's, that's not. Tell you what, I've already arranged for the truck that you're buying. You just have to go pay the guy. <laughs> and then it's one of those moments where you go, huh? And he goes, yeah, it's, it's a 1990 Dodge diesel. It's great. They're reliable. It doesn't need a lot of work to it. You know, you're going to love it. Tap, tap on the back. Now let's go pay the guy. <laughs> oh, Great. And you look under the hood and you go, where are the spark plugs? <laughs> but I hated that truck. I absolutely hated it. It was a four-wheel drive 727 truck. And for anyone who's owned those 727 trucks, um, that was the heaviest transmission the Chrysler had at the time. It was a 727 that was originally designed and developed for the Hemi cars back in the 60s. And they did some internal slight changes um, so that they could work with the diesel. But pedal on the floor was 71 mile an hour downhill. And wow. I got it on the highway for the first time in the interstate. And I realized that I was three quarter way to the floor and I was doing 55 mile an hour and people are blowing past me with the horn. You're going, what's wrong with us? And you just keep <laughs> leaning. You're now you're kind of got your hand on your knee, holding your foot to the floor <laughs> and you realize you're only doing 70. And then you go downhill and you get that extra one mile an hour and you go, this just isn't going to be right. I like, I want a five speed. The, the automatic isn't right. I really want a dually. So I had, 100% intention of selling that truck and I went looking for a replacement truck 
Um, and I found my crew cab, which is my four door. I wanted big go home, you know, as big truck as I could be. And that turned my hate for that first truck eventually into a love. And that's where it started to change because I got that crew cab and ended up having to do a transmission repair on it. It was already a, a diesel swap. So it had a get drag G360 in it, which are notorious for, unfortunately, they were really a gas or tranny that was used behind a diesel. Their torque rating was 420 foot pounds, but it wasn't really designed for diesel foot pounds. And um, that transmission was toast. And I had planned over the course of the next month to pull the transmission out, rebuild it and put it back in and then sell the other truck. Now that I had a dependable uh, transmission in the new truck and well, that turned into a 13 year restoration. And the more I got into that truck, well, now the silver truck became, Hey, you gotta, you gotta have a truck still, you're on a farm, you still got to make it work. And that truck began evolving and both trucks ended up being restored at pretty much the same time. And both of them were going through stuff and I just fell more and more in love with the trucks. And that was through the two thousands. By the time I hit 2010, yeah, it was far gone. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like you to take me through either specific parts of that year range or what it was in particular that made you stick with it. Because first gens for me, they were, I was too young to really, I didn't, I didn't know what a diesel was or anything like that. And the second gens, I kind of, I knew what they were. They were different. I remember the redesign and it was huge in the media in 94 when they changed the body style. But I didn't really start to pay attention to trucks till like 2005, six, seven. And, you know, so if you're in the mid 2000s, what about that 89 to 93 just grabbed you and you've stuck with it? Well, once I got over my hate for the 90, um, I fell in love with the curves of that body style. That's really what it is. And I know everyone laughs when I say the curves of that body style, being it's kind of shaped like a brick, but it's just, there's something about the body lines of that, that I, I absolutely just fell in love with. It just, I guess it starts with, you know, a look of a vehicle and that's where it starts. But once you rebuild your first one, you realize how simple these trucks really are. And that's something that's missing in a lot of today's trucks. Yeah. I've been around my dad's trucks. I've serviced his trucks. He's always owned newer mega cabs and, you know, third gens, fourth gens. And I've been able to compare the two. And I will say, I absolutely love working on the simplicity of the first gens. They're just so simple. Yeah, they mechanically leave some things to be desired. If you, you want to have a bit more power than the factory 160 horsepower, yeah, you got to upgrade some stuff to make it tow like today's modern vehicles and all. But it's all easy to do. There's no computers on these trucks. Um, even when you got into some of the second gens, you were computer controlled. On these first gens, you can literally run the engine with one 12 volt signal wire. So if you had a major system meltdown, you literally can get your truck running one wire and you will get your butt home. And that is something that I can honestly say there's not too many vehicles that you can do that with. The reliability of the Cummins is great. Um, I've, I've done a lot of stuff with these trucks over the years and having that reliability under the hood when you're towing a trailer far from home and I do tow coast to coast with my trucks, um, having that confidence that you are going to get home is huge for me. And you know, not all the brands of vehicles can say that they have that. I mean, there's been a lot of diesel trucks over the years. Some were better than others. And for me, that's huge. And it keeps me in that first gen circle. And the fact that you can fix most of the stuff, the joke always is with duct tape and bailing wire, you can pretty much fix anything on a first gen. It's not far off the truth. <laughs> <laughs> with restoring and working on both of these, and as time has gone on, how hard was it to find parts or little things that you may need for that? Yeah. Truck? And I bet especially now it's really, really hard. Yeah, that that has been my biggest thorn on my side. I, I mean, I truly love these trucks and I love everything about them. And I try to encourage people to get into them. But when people ask me very honestly, what is the one thorn with working in these trucks? The biggest thing is parts availability. Um, when I started restoring the crew cab, that was 2004. And quite honestly, most of my paychecks at that age were going straight to the dealer. Every month I'd go to the dealer and say, okay, this, this is the list of parts. How many are left in Chrysler's system? And we created a spreadsheet that was the least amount of parts available in Chrysler's system to most. And I literally started going down the list and saying, okay, there's only three of these left in national inventory. That's the first thing that I want to order. Oh, I still have a bit of my paycheck left over. I want this part as well. 
And next month you go back to dealer. Okay, let's order this one, this one, and this one. I mean, I was able to order brand new a brand new grill for the crew cap. That the one that's on that truck came from the dealer. And there's just so many things. Now, in saying all that, there was a lot of stuff that already in 2004 wasn't available anymore. Auto manufacturers tend to have a rule of 10 years that they keep parts for. And they were very accurate to that. Cab lights, for example, already in 2003 were not available. And that got worse and worse. By the time 2015 came around, uh, and I was trying to finish off the crew cab restoration, there was, I'd say, probably 95% of the parts were no longer available. A lot of stuff that I had originally talked to the dealer about, stuff I couldn't afford at the time, because you're on a school budget, and that eventually became your early working budget. And yeah, there's stuff that you couldn't afford. And by the time I went to get them, they just weren't available anymore. How did that turn into a business? Because when I was on your, I was on your Instagram and I clicked on your website, and I was going through your about us and what you do, and I really loved it because I I haven't restored a vehicle, but when I think of doing it, the first thing I think about is okay, make sure the engine, transmission, the drive line is going to work. But then I think there's all these other components and things that just with time and with the sun and weather and like cab lights, headlights, stickers, like I want it to look as close to 1993 showroom floor as I can. And I really appreciated the way the website explained it and what you guys do, but I want our listeners to know how this passion also turned into a business where you're, you're, you're servicing an 89 to 93s and providing a lot of value and opportunity for somebody who either buys this truck or wants to restore one that they have? Well, I I got to the point by 2015 that if I couldn't buy parts from my own truck, everybody else was in the same boat, obviously. And it's not a good boat to be in. Uh, by that point, these trucks had been out of production now for 22, 23 years, and Chrysler didn't have stock on anything. You know, used slash new parts that people had that were selling on Craigslist or marketplace, et cetera, had pretty much dried up. And uh, I was actually at a, at an event known as Woodward dream cruise, which is one of the largest automotive events that are held. And they have 30, 40,000 vehicles and a million people. And Chrysler does a very large display there. And I happened to be talking to the right person. I mentioned to them, you know, Hey, you guys, like, it would be nice if you offered some parts for those of us who own these old trucks again, and they actually laughed at me. And I kind of went, okay. And he goes, man, you're asking for parts. You're not following. I said, yeah, you are you work for Mopar. That's what you guys do. And he goes, no. What do we do as a company? I said, you make vehicles. He said, right. You didn't say we make parts. He said, we want you all to buy new vehicles because that's what we are. We're an auto manufacturer. We don't make parts for our vehicles after 10 years because, quite honestly, that's not in our best interest. So, he said to me, "What you know? If you're needing parts, why don't you make them?" Uh, my career, I'm I'm in the manufacturing sector, so and he knew this, and he just said, "Like, why don't you make parts?" And I said, "Well, quite honestly, I don't know what's involved." And he said, "We have a program known as the Mopar Authentic Restoration Program, and the way that works is Chrysler's parts division, Mopar, works with a specific company. In this case, it turned out to be me." And they go through all the parts that the market needs. So we co-develop. They look at every part. They help with engineering drawings when they can. Sometimes stuff isn't available and they have to reproduce the stuff from scratch. But the idea is that we can reintroduce the parts that look identical to what you purchased through the parts department or came on your vehicle from the assembly line. And there is to be virtually no variation from what was originally made to what we reproduce. And I like that uh, for mostly for the sake of by the 25 year mark, there was a lot of parts that started floating up onto the surface of the market that were made offshore. A lot of parts that are made in Taiwan, China, um, you know, there, there's places around the globe that make a lot of auto parts, but they're aftermarket ones and they don't hold the same quality standards that Mopar held. And I'll be the first to admit the headlight buckets on my 90, I replace every two years because the lenses fall out, the paint starts peeling off and that bothered me. I mean, I've been, I've bought these lights now probably eight times and I shouldn't be changing the headlight buckets that often. And for me, I know that the original Mopar parts lasted 30 years. If you looked after your vehicle, a lot of the stuff is in good condition. So there's definitely a parts quality difference that you can do in manufacturing between offshore and here. So that all came together with my saying to them, all right, I'd like to explore this restoration program. And it took about four and a half years to sort out paperwork. When people tell you there's a lot of paperwork involved with this, there is because they need to ensure that I'm going to uphold their quality standards. 
part of the program is I can reproduce badges that go on the side of the vehicles that say Dodge Ram, for example. They don't want just anyone to be able to do that. And, you know, a year later, the, the paint's peeling off the badges and all. They want to make sure that they've effectively vetted the companies to do this and make sure that the owners of the company, which in this case is me, that I understand the vehicle and what the vehicle represents to the market. In this case, I very much understand what that vehicle represents to the market because I'm my worst critic. Because when I do my restorations, I like all authentic Mopar parts. So if I'm going to reproduce a part, it better be my own quality standards. So that's effectively where First Gen Industries was born. We came out of that need of the market and we started retooling stuff. And it does take a while to retool. Some tools can take a year, 12 months of machining time. You've got six, seven, eight hundred hours in a CNC to make sometimes one mold. And some of these molds are honestly 2,000, 3,000 pounds. Some of these things are huge to make some of these parts. So it's a slow ramp up being how much time has to go into it, but we are going down the road of making these parts available again. That is that is really impressive because when I think of you know, being an enthusiast and loving this truck and you go to you know a huge event or something like that, and then being able to reproduce a part that Chrysler or Dodge had on a truck in 89 to 93, they give it the stamp of approval. Hey, you can do this. And now you're able to offer it to the public. Like that's what, that's what I would want as an enthusiast. I want as close as I can get to something that came on a 1990 or 93 or 89 truck. And so I think being able to offer that is really unique. Very much so. And I, I will take it one step further. It was unique because my background isn't an auto parts manufacturer. Yes, I've been, I've been in manufacturing my entire career, but for me, this was never about money. This was quite quite honestly, I I took out a massive loan to make this company happen because I wanted to do the tooling here. My parts aren't manufactured offshore. My parts are made here in North America. A lot of the parts that are on these trucks came from Canada and US, and I have stuff that's being reproduced in the United States, and I have parts that are being reproduced in Canada as the parts originally were. And I'm trying to keep as authentic as I can to that, because for me, I know that it's North American quality. There's something to that. And at the end of the day, you're 100% right. I get to see people starting to install these parts that I make on their vehicles, and it makes me happy inside. I don't take a cent from this company. It's not my day job. Um, I, I work this afternoons, evenings, weekends. But for me, this was never about money. This is strictly about passion that I want to offer parts. And if I were to take a paycheck out of this, there's that much less dollars to throw back into more tooling so the next part can be developed. That is what my goal was from the start with this company is I, I want to change a community that I've been highly active in for over 20 years because it's a passion thing. And the moment money would get involved, that changes things because it becomes a business. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it does. And I think if, if I was in the position of having one of these trucks and I wanted to restore it and I go onto a search engine and type in, you know, first gen headlights or cab lights or anything like that, I would gravitate towards the company that I knew was passionate about it. And I know that, you know, when people go on a website, they might not click the about us. They might not read into it. But for those who listen to the podcast, I really wanted them to know that because it's not just a business that's looking to make a quick buck, sell you some stuff, get out the door, and two years later you can't get in contact with them. It's it's just something you're so passionate about and you wanted that quality and that availability. And you know, that kind of leads me to this this other question I wanted to ask you. I've always been curious about it. Is I think back to that time frame, so nineteen eighty nine, Ford had the IDI, there was a GM six two. And I don't know if you know the answer to this, but what was Chrysler's thinking at that time or, or how did they approach releasing this? Because I think in a way, the, the, the five nine just changed the diesel landscape and ownership a bit. It kind of pushed it forward, which even today it's still living off of that reputation. But do you know what, what really pushed them to bring that to market and combine Cummins with their, their Dodge platform? I do actually, I've been very fortunate that I've been around these trucks since the late nineties when the engineers who developed all this stuff were still a part of this. And I've been very fortunate that I had met so many people through the Mopar community and I attended so many events. I actually uh, developed friendships with the folks who were involved with the development of both the Cummins and the Dodge joint venture. 
So I got to hear this firsthand. And to answer your question in detail, we have to go back actually a little further. So I'm going to throw the question out to you. What's the first year of Dodge diesel pickup truck? Ooh. Hmm. Late thirties, early forties. Actually, no, it goes back even farther than that. I think. Well, yeah, if we want to really play <laughs> back, it's actually 1964 was the first diesel pickup truck that Dodge played with, but that's in very limited volume. The next one was 1978 when they came out with a Mitsubishi diesel. It was actually a forklift engine that went into the Ram pickup trucks. And they had come out with that because of the OPEC oil embargoes and all that they were having the issues through the seventies. They wanted something that was small and fuel efficient. And they put this engine in there, but the problem is it was so underpowered that it literally took about a mile and a half to get the truck up to 60 mile an hour. So it was such a sales flop that when Lee Iacocca took over uh, running Chrysler after the government bailout in 1980, that, Lee Alcoca basically said to the truck division, we need to deal something with our sales here. Through the early 80s, Chrysler owned 3% of the truck market. You do the math on that. That is peanuts in volume. So Chrysler had kind of looked at their very aged platform. I mean, they designed that first gen body style in 1972 was the first year of it. So they designed that late 60s. That's why these first gens, even in 93, are so similar to 1960s technology because they actually are. So by 1983, they had dropped the club cab. That was the last year for it because they weren't selling enough. 1985, they dropped the crew cab. So they're down to a regular cab. Their plan was to actually exit the truck market by 1987. They just, they didn't want to be involved in anymore because they weren't selling enough. So Lee Iacocca came along and said to a gentleman by the name of Troy Simonson, who, for those of you who know your Mopar background, uh, there was the factory backed race team, the Ram Chargers and the Golden Commandos. And one was Plymouth, one was Dodge. And those were the factory teams that were out developing the Max Wedges, the Hemi Cars, 446 Packs. That's the group that did this. Well, after the 60s cars kind of fizzled out because of the oil uh, thing in the 70s, Troy ended up into the truck division. And many know the little red express trucks and the Warlocks and all those. He was responsible for developing those. And then came in Leah Koch and said, Troy, we need a diesel. I want you to go out there and find a diesel. So Troy was set with going to find a diesel manufacturer that they could do a joint venture with. And this started around 1981, 1982. He did visit Cummins. Uh, They tried to sell him on a 4BT, which was actually installed in a Ford van. And he told me, he said it was the most underpowered sluggish thing he had ever experienced. And he said that was not what they wanted. So he left Cummins and continued on. And they talked to Perkins. They talked to, Caterpillar, pretty much every diesel manufacturer under the sun. Well, in 1984, uh, he got a call back from Cummins saying, hey, we've got a 6BT that we think you might you know, be able to do and fit. Um, so he went down and talked to them a bit and they said, you send us a truck and we'll install it in there. And if you like it, then you know you can move forward. And he said, sure. So they sent down a 1985 Ram and it was red and white and sent it down to Cummins and they proceeded to install the first Cummins diesel in the Ram pickup and Troy went down and test drove it. He told me also that he he actually saw the truck before he got to Cummins because he said he was driving down I-69 from Detroit and he said he saw a 1985 Ram that looked awful similar to what (laughs) he had sent down there blow past him at close to 100 mile an hour and when he later got there he realized that was the truck (laughs) <laughs> and he test drove and he said, absolutely, this is, this is fantastic. This is what we're looking for. And they proceeded to sign the contract in 1985 and began multiple mules. Uh, they had about 48 trucks involved in the program and they developed it. And as we all know, in the summer of 1988, the 1989 models launched and they came out with this truck and they literally took the market by storm because this was the first time that there was a true equipment diesel in a pickup truck. And you think about this at the time, you just had the whole GM fiasco where you had gas blocks with diesel heads and the the diesel market is not like it is today. Today we look at diesels and pickup trucks and that just makes sense. But at that time, gasoline V8s ruled the world. So you have people who already are kind of cautious to stick their toe in the water, but then you have a true diesel brand like Cummins that every equipment bulldozer truck, you know, cross-country trucker, et cetera. They all know the name Cummins and they know it's reliability. 
And there, the part that blows me away is Troy told me the entire business plan was built off of a thousand trucks. They figured if they could sell a thousand Cummins trucks, that they had something that was really quite special and they could probably keep the truck line going. And again, when you own 3% of the truck market, a thousand, <laughs> I guess, is a, a quite a big number. We look at that today and go, that's peanuts. But they uh, they opened up sales on those trucks and they sold 11,000 trucks in two months. And they actually had to shut orders off because they couldn't build that many. At that point, Cummins was actually grabbing engines out of their North Carolina joint venture with Case. So that all the non-intercooled engines were actually not built on a Cummins engine line. They were actually coming off the Case bulldozer line. And those CPL 0804s are the same engines that were being used in bulldozers and some of the heavier equipment. And they were just, for a thousand engines, they were just pulling a couple off to ship to Dodge. Well, suddenly Dodge has gone up to 11,000 engines and that's straining what that plant can do. That's a huge increase. So they shut it off and reopened orders for 1990 model year. And they had to shut it off at 16,000 because again, they surpassed the previous year's sales. And pretty much it's been year over year gains since the 1989 model year. That, all that is so fascinating. I didn't know that Dodge had played in a diesel game prior to 89. I always thought it that's when it started. I didn't know about anything in the late 70s or or the 60s. But when I have thought historically about, you know, how did we start you know with diesel pickup trucks and how much it's grown? I just think of that household name of Cummins. Like I've never talked to anybody even if they're a GM fan or Ford fan that's told me Cummins sucks. I've never heard that. <laughs> and you take that and you combine it with Dodge or Ram now, which, you know, they've always, it, it's always kind of seemed like they've been playing catch up to Ford and GM with different things. But that, that Cummins engine in that truck, to me, always kind of set it apart. And in some ways, the other ones have been playing catch up ever since, trying to equal what it does, even you know, up into the six, seven coming. So it's really fascinating to hear all that information. I didn't know any of that. Yeah. A lot of people don't, unfortunately, this information is not well spread. I mean, quite honestly, as involved as I have been with these trucks, if it wasn't for Troy Simonson, who was the head of the Dodge venture of doing this and a gentleman by the name of John Keel, who was the head gentleman involved on the Cummins side to make this deal happen. I've been very fortunate to have back in the late 2000s, early, you know, 2010, 2011, to be able to sit down with those two for hours and pick their brains and ask them questions because I'm one of those that when your passion overflows and you just want more info, but you can't find it, the history books don't have it. Where do you find it? And then yeah. one night I happened to be sitting at a turbo diesel register event and, you know, he, here comes Troy Simonson and he comes to sit with the group. And then I sat there till 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> I mean, we had next morning, we had to be at the Cummins engine plant for doing a tour, but there we're still sitting on two picking tables. Everybody else is gone. And there's the two of us talking about, you know, all the things that I had wondered for years. I just wanted to know about this stuff. And here's a gentleman telling you, oh yeah, this is what we did for this. And this is what we did for that. And that's how I know what the transmission, the, those get tracks. Cause I asked that question, like, why did you use a transmission that didn't seem to hold up well? And the answer was because it was within specification. Getrag was a supplier for Chrysler at the time. All their, you know, Dodge Spirits came with Getrags. Um, all their manual transmission stuff was Getrag. So they just went to their supplier and said, hey, what do you have for this? And the spec on the first gen Cummins engine is 400 foot pounds and that transmission is rated for 420. And they said, hey, we're good to go. But I guess it, at stock power levels and if you're towing within the factory tow spec of, you know, 9,600 pounds. Yeah. It probably did last longer than everyone who connected the medium duty float to it. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, I, I don't know if this came up in conversations you had, but what led to intercooling them versus the non-intercooled? So this is a common misconception. Everyone will tell you that the reason the intercooler happened was for power reasons. And that is a hundred percent incorrect. And if you actually know the, your first gen timelines, you had the non-intercooled ran from 1989 to 1991. And as of January 1st, 1991, which is a half year now for your model, January 1st marked the new emission standards for diesels. So as much as we think they were non-emission engines back, you know, in the first gen 12 valve world, no, there was already emission standards. I mean, they weren't stringent like today where you need diesel particle filters and def fluid and any of that stuff. But January 1st, 91 required the next tier emissions for nitrous oxide emissions. And the way that you have to do that is you have to lower combustion temperature. 
So you put a charge air cooler on and you know, your intake plenum temperatures drop and you now meet the new nitrous oxide emissions. So that is why there is two versions of the 1991 model year. You have what's known as a 91 and a 91 and a half because your 1990 carry over to 19, early 91 is all non-intercooled. And then your January 1st changeover, which I still don't understand to the day I've gone actually and dug into this. Dodge didn't change over January 1st. I don't understand how they made this possible, but they were actually shipping non-intercooled engines until mid-February. So mm. I, it's one of those things I'd love to know how they got away with that. But yeah, that's <laughs> then the 91 and a half model year becomes intercooled and it was strictly for emissions reasons. That's really interesting and something I didn't know as well, which I'm learning a lot on this podcast is the perception is always, well, early 2000s is when emissions changed. That's where the six liter came from. Right. It's where the common rail five nine, why the LB seven was there, but it goes even back, you know, a decade plus prior. It does. And part two, another thing I, I should note is when they went to an intercooled engine, they no longer got the bulldozer engines. So they had now developed enough of a demand with Cummins that Cummins went and built CMEP, which is the Cummins mid-range engine plant that's in uh, in Indiana. And that is strictly dedicated to Dodge production. And at that point in time, Dodge was buying enough. Now they were able to say to Cummins, we want our own CPL. So for the Cummins world, every engine that Cummins builds has a CPL number, which is a control parts list number. So the way they identify that is the non-air-cooled engines are a CPL 0804. And it, you can find a CPL 0804 in a bulldozer, a bus, a Dodge pickup. As long as it's the same CPL number, that means all your parts are the same. So come 1991, they're launching the intercooled one, which is your CPL 1351. And now they had gone to Cummins and said, okay, we want our, the engine a little bit cheaper. We've got more volume. And Cummins said, no problem. We're going to do your own CPL. And they actually got, there's, there's about 80% of the parts between those two engines are different. And this is wow. a common misconception. When it comes to first gen diesels, everyone says, well, they're all the same. No, there's yeah. not. There's actually three different engines between 81 or sorry, 89 and 93. There's the 0804 engine, the 1351 and the 1579. So there's three different engines, three different configurations. You go between non-intercooled and intercooled, your pistons are different, your head's different, your injectors are different, your injection pump is different, your block is different. I mean, yeah, okay, valve covers are the same, but you there's a lot of stuff that doesn't interchange there. The non-intercooled block is heavier than the intercooled block because they knew that it had to withstand higher combustion temperature temperatures than a bulldozer than they would in a road vehicle. So what ended up happening is those 91 and a half engines were a lot cheaper to manufacture, cheaper, you know, block, cheaper pistons. Cheap, and that became the Dodge spec engine, which is why when you go to tune them, you can always get more power out of a 0804 engine than you will the 1351s. That's really interesting. I knew I was going to learn some stuff on this podcast, <laughs> but I didn't know it'd be a solid 30 minutes of it. <laughs> I like being able to share because so many people don't know this. You just see a first gen and everyone just assumes a first gen is a first gen. Yeah. But there's that, actually so many changes. Well, that's what I thought. I, I just thought non-intercooled, different transmissions, intercooled, different transmissions. That's it. Everything swaps over. I didn't know they were that different. They are that different. And then they obviously did the change between the early non uh, the early intercooled ones and then they went to the 1579 engine. Uh, differences, turbos are different. You had a 21 centimeter housing from the factory on your early 91s to about mid 92. And then they went back to an 18 centimeter because they were having so many spool issues, which is why those who have that 12 month production window of mid 91 to mid 92, their trucks are always so much slower. They're all still rated at 160 horse, 400 foot pounds, but I've, I've driven those trucks too. I've owned those trucks. They are significantly slower. I've yet to put two stock trucks on a dyno and compare the two, but I do know that my truck, my 90, when it was stock, still rated 160 horsepower, but I put 178 down on the dyno on a 100% stock truck. Wow. So <laughs> they, they do have a bit more power, in my personal opinion. I've, I've arm wrestled the Cummins guys to tell me this. <laughs> I've talked to many of their uh, guys before they passed away, and most of these guys who I learned this from have passed now. But I, I said, okay, you got to tell me, was this like the 1960s where Chrysler rated the heavy at 425 horse, but was actually closer, you know, to 450, 460? And they said, no, they were all rated at 160. But I can tell you there, there is a difference. In the case of the non-intercooled, those engines were actually sold as 300 horsepower engines that were detuned to 160 
at Dodge's request because they wanted to keep a transmission in the truck and they had nothing more potent to do that. So those guys who are owning those engines, you can actually just adjust your fuel screw and you can put that engine back at 300 horse with nothing else. Wow. That's, that's really good information. I know that um, you know, we chat a little bit about the podcast as far as questions that come in and, and there is a general, um, I wouldn't say transition, but a general kind of movement of people wanting to go back to simpler vehicles. And especially with how complex the newer ones have gotten, they want something that gets good fuel economy, they can fix, they don't need a bunch of computers and, you know, a degree in, in, in software engineering to do it. And they love that. And they might not be brand loyal. So they look back to the Ford OBS, um, you know, the GM 6.2 or 6.5 or the first gens. And so for someone that is saying, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm interested. I like that body style. I, I like what I heard. This is really cool. I've heard good things about them, but I don't know a lot. What are three tips you would give someone who's looking at an 89 to 93 to just find the right truck, whether that's looking at their goals, are they going, you know, going to modify it? Or um, you know, what are just some different things with those particular trucks to keep in mind as they're making a purchasing decision? So not one of my three points, but I will say regardless of which vehicle you want to buy, have a vision in your head first of what your end goal is, because that will dictate some of what your truck is. If you want to basically buy a truck and do very little to it, order a couple parts online and you can have your truck ready to go, um, that's very different than if you want to do a multi-year restoration on it. Because at that point in time, I would say look toward Ford or Chev if you're not brand loyal, because you can pretty much order every part you need. When it comes to these first gen things, I mean, I'm in the process of reproducing a lot of this, but there's approximately 15,000 parts on a vehicle. I don't have all those available yet. Yes, in the next couple of years, uh, but that's going to be different. So that's my that's my forerun to what I'm going to say here. But three things, first and foremost, especially for those who are in the salt world um, and you're not in California, Arizona, and the south, rust. Um, there's several spots to look on these trucks. The biggest one is the drip rail, which is just above your windshield. Uh, they are a two-piece roof pan, and they press the two together and spot weld them. And then they put caulking in the drip rail to seal it, and that's how they did it at the factory. Well, as time has gone on, the caulking tends to crack, and then now you have water that's going down between the two layers. It sits in behind the roof, so you don't see it from the inside, you don't see it from the outside, and it rots your drip rail from behind. And there has been thousands of these trucks that have been scrapped due to that. And no one makes a replacement part yet for that. Um, so watch that. Your cab mounts, notorious uh, spots to rot out on these trucks. Nine times out of 10, it's caused by the floor pan, though. Your floor pan, there's a uh, driver's side knee vent that is the old school vent. You can slide it open and you have wind that blows in while you drive. Uh, they use an open cell phone gasket. And after 30 years, they have disintegrated. And when it rains, the water goes down. And it, what's supposed to deflect it, it now goes down underneath your carpet and rots out the floorboards. I've had trucks out of Texas that I've owned that have rotted out floorboards in that area. And it's strictly because water gets in there and it gets stuck under the carpet. People don't see it. And eventually it's going to eat that metal. Um, over the bo rear box uh, wheel arches, that's another common spot. And one that very few people actually speak on. They'll talk all the sheet metal all day long, but no one ever tells you, check your frame rail. Uh, where your fuel tank is on these trucks are notorious for salt getting up in behind and they can never get washed out. And I have had trucks that I've been able to stick my arm through their frame rail and they're so thin that I've literally bent frames in half by jumping on them. That's how thin the frame rails can get behind the fuel tank. Wow. So rust is your biggest thing. Driveline wise, these are fantastic trucks. That's my second thing is engines are pretty good. Uh, they have a uh, dowel pin issue where some of them can fall out. Um, I would say if 0.1% of all Cummins engines had this issue, a lot of people made a bigger deal about these than it actually is. Everyone says, oh, you got to fix your dowel pin. Yes, you do. It's good to be mindful, but I've been in dozens and dozens of engines and I've only ever seen one that moved a little bit and that's it. So that's one thing to watch for. Your biggest thing will be uh, drive lines for your rear uh, of the trucks. You're going to have a Dana 70 in all your diesel trucks. Um, they are prone to spin carrier bearings. So if your truck's new to you or you're driving and you hear something a little funky, check your carrier bearings. Uh, they're very often spun. For your transmissions, unfortunately, you had a great engine, um, but Chrysler struggled to put a good transmission behind it. The non-air cooled trucks will have a 727 as an automatic. That is a three-speed. And for 
91 and a half, they brought in a four speed, which is basically a 727 with an overdrive bolted to the back of it. And none of these are lockup torque converters. So you had an excess heat when you were towing and excess heat will kill things. Unfortunately, it'll eventually bake your internals of the transmission. And even by 93, they had what's known as a super LE package on the automatic. And it had three transmission coolers on the truck. Wow. And it's insane when you think about that, but heat was their enemy. And by 94, they put a lockup torque converter into the 47 RHs and that allowed you to at least have a lot less heat. But that's your big thing. If you're in a stick, uh, listen very closely through first and third. Third is going to be your first one to normally make noise because that's where people start finally hauling on it because you've got some speed behind you. If you hear growling, like literally a dog going, you'll get that out of the transmission, especially lower RPM. You're in for transmission rebuild. For the automatics, yeah, check to see slippage. Put your foot on the brake, put your foot on the gas. Um, yeah, there's going to be a certain amount of slippage, but if you're into 2000 RPM and you still haven't moved and your toes just kind of sitting on the brake, yeah, you're in for a transmission rebuild. And the 518s were very common for that. 727s, not as much. Uh, they were a much harsher shift, um, whereas the 518s were a soggier shift. They tried to preserve their transmissions because they were blowing too many up under warranty. So th those would be the things I would say on there. And if really the last one is uh, suspension, mostly on the two-wheel drives, um, you had really primarily a gas suspension that they stuck a 1100 pound engine on top of and expected it to live there. Watch your front ball joints. They're very prone to popping out of the control arms. No one currently makes reproduction control arms. So definitely do a double check of that. And there's multiple linkages in your steering. I have seen many people have close to fatal accidents because their front ends are falling apart. Uh, for the four-wheel drive trucks as well, they still use the same style of steering shaft where there's known as a rag joint. Watch that, guys. There's a company called Borgson. They make a replacement steering shaft with W joints. This is a safety thing. I will not use a factory steering system in any of my builds because they are very prone to separating at speed. And now suddenly you have no steering. So that's one after 30 years. Hands down, spend the 250 bucks, upgrade that part, but double check your steering on both men. Uh, on, the two wheel drive and four wheel drives, just double check that stuff. That, those would be my points that people should watch for. I know for those who may already have one of these trucks and after the podcast, they click onto your Instagram and they see, you know, the two trucks and the other ones you've, you've worked on that they're going to say, you know, I, instead of buying a new one or something like that, I want to invest in, into this first gen. What kind of parts do you have available now? How can people find you, not just on Instagram, but the website? If they, they might have questions. They might uh, you know, be in the middle of a project, but I definitely want to make sure that those people out there that have them, they can connect with you for these hard to find parts, these things that they're looking for to make the truck look and perform how they want. So as far as parts go, we have dozens of parts currently in tooling that we'll be still releasing this year, but we we've got the cab lights that go on the roof, the wiring harnesses that feed them. We've got templates. We've got decals all the factory decals that i love on my vehicles because it makes them look factory correct how to route your belt uh, if your vehicle's been repainted most of these decals are missing uh we've got lighting we've just launched the dually fenders for everyone who's got a dually truck i guarantee your fender has been hit at some point in time we've got dually fenders for them now and we're getting into trim and all sorts of other things as well as far as where people can find it website is uh, firstgenindustries.com you can also find that uh, company on Instagram under at first gen industries, same thing for Facebook. I'm there as well. My personal stuff, if you want to follow is at W350 crew cab. Uh, that's my Instagram account. That's my personal account. You can see all my builds there that I'm working on and a good chunk of the trucks that I own, not all of them, but a, a good chunk of them are on there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a, it was a complete pleasure to chat with you today. And I love, I love learning about things. I, I, I don't know, didn't even know that I didn't know. And so being able to chat with you and learn about the history of, of an iconic brand and, and the combination of you know, Dodge and slash Ram and Cummins and the background of it was incredibly helpful. And I appreciate as a diesel enthusiast, <clears throat> what you're doing to be able to keep the parts availability alive for people who own these trucks so they can stay on the road and the next generation can enjoy them and have fun with them and just be able to you know, have a solid, reliable truck. So I appreciate you coming onto the podcast, chatting with me and uh, dropping some knowledge. Happy to be here, Patrick. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time. It's an honor to be able to share my passion with everyone who's listening all over the world.
Don't forget, Diesel fans, make sure and head on over to Kershaw.KIAUSA.com. Use code Diesel20 for 20% off site-wide. They've got a ton of choices with you know, any budget in mind. So whether you're looking for something um, you know, to carry every day, you're going to use it you know, hard, beat it up a little bit, or you, know, you want something to show off to your friends or you know, out uh, hunting or fishing or anything like that, they've got a ton of choices. Um, we really appreciate them offering that to our listeners, be able to save some money. We know any little bit we can save can go a long way. I also want to give a shout out to some of our Patreon supporters, Wright's Diesel Services, Caleb, Tyler Lowe, and a 23 Diesel, all of our other Patreons, all of you who subscribe on YouTube, podcast apps, our Discord. Um, the the information, the feedback, the suggestions, it, it's what keeps our creativity going. There's so many different topics to, to cover, as I've mentioned before. That's so why we're doing four episodes a week. There's just so much to cover with Cummins, Duramax, Power Stroke, EPA news, shop news, um, life tips, business tips, so many things that some of our favorite racers or companies out there, you know, can share with us and, and help us. So we appreciate all your support these six years and look forward to bringing you guys even more awesome content. Until next time, keep the shiny side up.